Chapter Nineteen of the Young Woman's Guide to Excellence by William A. Alcott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Brea. Chapter Nineteen: Punctuality. No system can be carried on without both order and punctuality. I have already said something, incidentally, on both these topics, but their importance entitles them to a separate consideration. The importance of strict punctuality could be shown by appealing to hundreds of authorities, but I prefer an appeal to the good sense of my readers. How painful it is in a thousand instances of life to be but one minute too late, and how much evil it may, indeed, often does occasion, both to ourselves and others. Quote, Think of the difference, says the spirited writer, between arriving with a letter one minute before the post office is closed and arriving one minute after between being at the stage office a quarter of an hour too soon and reaching there a quarter of an hour too late between shaking a friend heartily by the hand as he steps on board his vessel bound to the indies and arriving at the pier when the vessel is under way and stretching her wide canvas to the winds think of this and a thousand such instances and be determined through life to be in time. End quote. Allow me to illustrate the important subject of which I am now treating by the case of a young mother. She wishes to go from Boston to Lowell. She leaves Boston in the cars which go at eleven and reach Lowell soon after twelve. She goes to spend the afternoon with a sick friend there, resolving to return at five, the hour when the last cars leave Lowell for Boston. Her infant is left for the time in the hands of a maiden sister, the husband being engaged in his shop and hardly knowing of her departure. She spends the afternoon with her friends, and her services are very acceptable, but ere she is aware, the bell at the railroad depot rings for passengers to Boston. A few moments are spent in getting ready and exchanging the parting salutation with those friends who, though aware of the danger of her being left, have not the honest plainness to urge her to make speed. She is at length under way, but on arriving at the depot, lo, the cars are started and are twenty or thirty rods distant. What can she do? Time and tide, and railroad cars, wait for none. It is in vain that she waves her handkerchief. The swift-footed vehicles move on and are soon out of sight. She returns, much distressed, to the house of her sick friend, unfit to render her any further service, to say nothing of the mischief she is likely to do by exciting her painful sympathies. But how and when is she to get home? There are no public means of conveyance back to the city till tomorrow morning, and the expense of a private conveyance seems to her quite beyond her means. How could I be so late, she says to herself? How could I run the risk of being thus left? Why was I not in season? What will my husband think, especially as I came off without saying anything to him about coming? But this, though much to distress her, is not all nor the most. Her poor babe, what will become of that? Her friends endeavour to soothe her by diverting her mind, but to no purpose, or nearly none. She is half distracted and can do nothing but mourn over her folly in being too late. But the weather is mild, and all is propitious without, except it is likely to be rather dark, and by means of the efforts of thoughtful friends, a coach is fitted out with a careful driver to carry her home this very evening. It will take five hours in all, and as it is now six, she will reach home at about eleven. The infant will not suffer greatly before that time. Finding herself fairly on the road, her feelings are somewhat composed, and she just now begins to think what her husband will do when he comes home from the shop at seven and finds she has not arrived. She is afraid he will be at the extra pains and expense to come for her, perhaps in the darkness pass by her and go on to Lowell. And her fears are partly realised, after much anxiety and some complaining, which, however, I will not undertake to justify, the husband is on the road with her vehicle going to Lowell to assist her in getting home. They meet about half way from place to place. The drivers recognize each other, though rather more than in the darkness could have been expected. The coach from Lowell returns, 
and that from boston taking in both passengers wheels them back in haste to their home in their joy to find matters no worse they forget to recriminate each other and think only of the timid sister with whom the infant was left in charge for in the hurry of getting off the husband had made no provision for quieting her fears of being alone she passes the time however in much less mental agitation than might have been expected and takes as good care as she can of a fretful crying half-starved babe as the clock strikes one the family are all quiet in bed and endeavouring to sleep how much uneasiness is here caused by being just about one minute and no more too late and whence came it not by her not knowing she was running a risk by being tardy not that she had no apprehensions of evil not because her conscience was uneducated or unfaithful it was neither nor any of these there was in the first place a little want of decision she suffered herself to vacillate between a sense of duty and the inclination to say a few words more or bestow another parting kiss and in the second place it was the wretched habit she had always indulged of delaying and deferring everything she put her head or hand to do till the very last moment i will give you a brief but correct account of her general habits not that the picture is a very uncommon one but you may view it in connection with the anecdote i have related and thus get a tolerable idea of the inconveniences to which the wretched habit of which i have spoken is continually exposing her she makes it a rule no i will not say that for she has no rules but she has a sort of expectation on the subject to rise at five o'clock yet i do not suppose she is up at five six times in the year she is never awake at that time or but seldom unless she is awakened her husband indeed makes it a sort of rule to wake her at that hour but he alas poor man has no rules for himself or others and if he undertakes to awaken her at five it is usually ten or fifteen minutes afterward and if she is left alone she is often in bed till half past five oftener indeed than up earlier the breakfast hour is six but i never knew the family to sit down at six it is ten minutes fifteen minutes thirty minutes or sometimes forty-five minutes after six before the breakfast is on the table the fire will not burn and the tea is not ready or the milk or cream for the latter has not arrived or something or other is the matter so she says and so she believes and indeed sometimes so it is the dinner time is half past twelve that is professedly so but it is not once in twenty times that they sit down much before one o'clock i have known it to be even later so it is with supper and i might add with everything else if an engagement is made directly or indirectly positively or only implied it is never fulfilled at the time she is never in her seat at church till almost everybody else is in and the services have commenced although the kind but too indulgent parson waits for some five or ten minutes for his whole congregation who alas he is unwittingly trained to delay in short she does nothing and performs nothing punctually not even going to bed for this is deferred to a very late hour sometimes till near midnight now herein is the secret the foundation rather of her trouble at lowell had she been trained to punctuality in other things she would in all probability have been punctual there the misfortune which i have described is but a specimen of what is ever and anon occurring in the history of her life nor are her sufferings though they are severe from her unhappy habit the end of the matter i have already more than intimated that her companion has caught the disease but it is still more visible in the conduct of her sons and daughters they like herself seldom do anything at the proper time they are never punctual in their engagements nor decided in their conduct i know not however what the daughters may yet do several of them being quite young if they should chance to meet with better instructions than they are accustomed to receive should take warning and do all they can in the way of self-improvement they may be able to break the chains of an inveterate and almost inconquerable habit and make themselves useful in their day and generation i do think most sincerely that if all the rest of the world were disorderly or fell short in matters of punctuality the young woman should not do so 
let her in every duty learn to be in time let her resolve to do everything a little before the time arrives nothing a moment after it the keeper of a boarding school who is at the same time the principal of one of our most flourishing schools for males and females makes it a point to have every one of his boarders in their seats at dinner when the clock strikes twelve which is the appointed hour and the late principal of a very highly distinguished female school in boston used to have every exercise regulated by a clock kept in the room whatever else was going on whether it was finished or unfinished whenever the hour for another exercise arrived it was attended to the whole school as if with one impulse seemed to obey the hour rather than the teacher such order and punctuality everywhere and in everything constitute the beauty of life and i was going to say the beauty of heaven in which this life should be a sort of emblem heaven in any rate is not only a world of order but of punctuality also and she who goes there must be prepared to observe both or it will be no heaven to her as i have strongly insisted in respect to the formation of other important habits so in regard to this it must be commenced in the smaller matters of life let the young woman be in time that is be punctual in the performance of what she regards as trifles and when she becomes a matron she will seldom be tardy in what are deemed the weightier matters i have spoken of the importance of punctuality and has strongly insisted that whatever is worth doing at all is worth doing well i am now about to insist with equal earnestness that what is worth beginning and performing well is worth doing thoroughly or finishing some young women never do anything thoroughly even the smallest matters all their lives long they live as it were by halves and do things by halves if they commence reading a book unless it is something very enticing or exciting they neither read it thoroughly nor finish it their dress is never put on thoroughly and even their meals are not thoroughly eaten in regard to what is last mentioned they fail in two respects either from fear that they shall be unfashionable if they use their teeth or from sheer carelessness in their habits they never masticate their food thoroughly and they never seem to get through eating the true way is to finish a meal in a reasonable time and then let the matter rest and never be found eating between meals whereas the class of persons of whom i am speaking seem to never begin or end a meal they are nibbling if food chance to fall in their way all their lives long but to return to other habits than those which pertain to eating and drinking this want of thoroughness of which i am speaking wherever it exists in a young woman will show itself in all or nearly all she does suppose she is washing dishes for example something is left unwashed which ought to have been washed something is left only partly washed or the whole being done in a hurry something is not set away in its place and along comes a child and knocks it over and breaks it perhaps she is sewing she is anxious to get her work along and though she knows how it ought to be done she ventures the slightest especially if it is the property of another or having done it well till she comes near the end the place where perhaps everything ought to be particularly firm and secure ought to be done thoroughly she leaves a portion of it half done and the garment gives way before it is half worn or she is cooking and though everything else is well boiled a single article is not well done which gives an appearance of negligence to the whole at any rate it is not done well and she gets the credit of not being a thorough housekeeper Quote, for who hath despised the day of small things end quote. is a scriptural inquiry on a most important subject and were it not likely to be construed into a want of reverence for sacred things the same inquiry might be made in regard to the matter before us there is a universal disposition abroad to despise small matters and to stigmatize him who defends their importance one might suppose a young woman would find out the mischiefs that result from a want of thoroughness by the inconvenience which inevitably results from it it is not very convenient or comfortable to be obliged to do a thing wholly over again or to suffer from want because a piece of work very trifling in itself was not done thoroughly 
nor is it convenient to go and wash one hand every time a lamp is used because it was not thoroughly cleaned or duly put in order when it should have been nor is it easy to clean an elegant carpet which has become soiled or to replace a valuable astral lamp or mirror which has been broken simply for the want of thorough attention in those who have the care of these things these little inconveniences constantly recurring might rouse the person to reflection one would think as effectually as occasional larger one we do not however always find it so young people ought to consider what a host of evils sometimes result from a slight neglect the trite saying quote, for want of a nail the shoe was lost for want of a shoe the horse was lost and for want of a horse the rider was lost End quote. will however illustrate this part of my subject had the single nail which was omitted the last one been driven and driven properly had the work in short been done thoroughly the shoe horse and rider might have all been preserved do not dread the imputation of being over nice or whimsical if you do your work thoroughly you must learn to regard your own sense of right your regard to duty as a thing of far more importance than either the sneers or the approbation of thousands of the unthinking I have heard an individual of great worth and respectability complain of a young friend of his because he made it a point to finish thoroughly everything he undertook and charge him with what he called a mania for finishing. I remember too a very worthy and in the main excellent farmer who used to complain of a very conscientious son of his because, forsooth, he was determined to finish everything he began in the best possible manner without paying much regard to the opinions of others but these facts only show that wise and good men may not fully understand the nature and power of habit or the necessity of being thorough in small as well as larger matters the first individual i have named was for ever suffering from his own want of thoroughness and was miserable through life and the last would have been far happier all his lifetime had he been as much disposed to finish the things he undertook as his son End of chapter nineteen